Welcome to Dollars in Data. Today we look at JSON files and how to generate them with SSIS 2012. Here's the full agenda, but briefly I'd like to point out that today's look at JSONs reveals a direction in which several of our videos are taking us. We're reviewing modular techniques that will be combined to form a sophisticated cloud-based analytics application. So JSON files are the new XML. The JavaScript object notation file format that became central to web service APIs and logs has now become fundamental to Big Data and Azure. Feel free to pause this video to review the examples shown below. Whether to project data or dynamically build configuration files, there are a variety of scenarios where we would like to generate JSON files. This video assumes the desire to generate those files as part of an automated data flow controlled by SSIS. So, our central problem is that SQL Server 2016 provides native support for JSON, but where does that leave the many shops that only have 2012 or 2014? Can we find a solution that doesn't require .NET programming? And is that solution provided and supported by Microsoft? Our response uses SSIS to interact with Microsoft's DocumentDB data migration tool command line interface. Much like we might use SSIS's DT exec UI, we will use the DocumentDB utility to create CLI arguments. Viewers will recall that DT exec UI can be used to generate CLIs for SQL agent jobs, for example. After creating CLI arguments, we'll then run the data migration tools executable and the arguments using SSIS's execute process task. By the way, an alternative is to use a new SSIS Dataflow destination to create an Avro file, but that has to be uploaded to an Azure blob. That's a fine scenario which is covered in another video, but the goal of this video is simply to create a local JSON file. That said, I'll finally point out that for a given data set, the schema produced by the DocumentDB data migration tool is different from that produced by the Azure blob destination in SSIS's Azure feature pack. And with regards to dependencies, the first link here shows where to download the data migration tool. The other links show where to download documentation. So here's some advice. The first thing I'll do is I'll point out that uh, the online documentation I pointed to in an earlier link would lead you to a page like this, and those pages are being updated on a regular basis. So here we see that something was updated in January of 2016, relatively recent. And that's great. And I, in so many ways, I think that BOL, Books Online, is becoming relatively outdated in favor of these articles. The other thing I would point out with regards to the services themselves are, how can we get a big picture as to where a service is in its life cycle? And I can select on these statuses. And I can see that you know there's some planned responses from uh, Microsoft. Uh, there's declined responses to a perceived problem. Let's just go ahead and focus on the planned. And two things jump out at us. First, uh, somebody went ahead and thought of the fact that, well, we need a backup solution. And apparently, it doesn't exist for DocumentDB, the service that is. And that makes a lot of sense. But it may not be something that you would have instantly thought of. Not only that, but we also see that it was a serious enough uh, thought that Microsoft does have plans to take action. So at a glance, we can really quickly see uh, what kind of gaps might exist in the product line's uh, uh, feature set and what Microsoft's response is. Now, another form of that is going to be seen within the service updates. So again, we come to the service update uh, page, and we see now document DB in this case. Uh, and then a number of different things that uh, could apply to uh, DocumentDB as a service update. One of the keys, for example, is where is it available? Well, it's only been available in the South Central region since November of 2015. And that indicates that, yes, it's relatively early in its life cycle. And there are, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a roadmap that still absolutely needs to be filled in for that service. On the topic of documentation, another quick side note to make is about service locations in general. And we already observed that DocumentDB was not available in the South Central until November of 2015. But that's something that you're going to want to be cognizant of for all other services as well. 
because it does have financial repercussions. Now back to dependencies, here's the environment in which our package was tested. And finally, we'll proceed with the demonstration itself. So here we are in the VM lab, and the first thing we'll do is take a look at the Data Migration Tools UI. And this was how the CLI was built up. And in order to put together that string of commands, I would have done something like select SQL, put in a connection string. By the way, that connection string is a little unusual insofar as it does not accept a provider key value pair. You'll see all that code when you access the final package from the TechNet gallery. I always appreciate when query files slash response files are provided, so one of those was taken advantage of. We'll see that later on as well. For target information, we put in JSON and ask that it be stored as a local file in a local directory and certainly can be pretty fine as well with some formatting. Uh, one thing I forgot, let me come back to this, is the nesting separator. The nesting separator, uh, I'll just show you an example because the picture is worth a thousand words there. Assume as part of this query that we had this query here. Now we'll see that this query has aliases that encompass multiple levels. Address dot versus address dot location dot. That's important because uh, just like with XML, JSON files can have nested objects. This query happens to lead to this type of JSON, nested. Now we're not going to be dealing with that, so we didn't put in a nesting separator. Instead, we wanted something that was very flat and tabular uh, to the point where our result looks something like this. But I just wanted to mention that. So we'll come back and we'll say that after having gone through some of the choices presented and documented in the data migration tool, uh, we're finally left with the ability to grab a, a, a CLI argument at the very end. And I'm not going to work through the whole thing, but you'll see the results and you'll play with that yourself. And the next thing I want to do is uh, I want to pull this particular command back out, and we'll put it in this location, we'll run it. Now all of this will eventually be called by SSIS, but I just wanted to show you quickly how we can do that outside of SSIS. So the commands that you're seeing here in the shell are located here. We see some of the, some of the arguments that could be provided. They have to all be strung together eventually, but I went ahead and gave them carriage return line feeds just so that you can quickly go over that. And then we've got a response file as well that was used. I'd mentioned that earlier. I really appreciate when that's uh, provided to us by Microsoft applications. And I can think of numerous instances where it is. Uh, SQL command, AS command, which is a product I really love. All those provide the same type of rich capabilities. So here's our CT. We've seen this in prior videos, by the way, that generates X number of rows of data, three in this case. And having run that, we then get this JSON. And there it is. So like I said, a very flat tabular uh, JSON file. Now let's take a look at the package we'll share on Microsoft's TechNet Gallery. First notice that we got rid of the JSON file that was populated out here previously through the command shell. And we'll take a look at some information that's provided to the process task. I'll only point out that some of this information is provided in different ways. Uh, one of these lines is provided through a literal. The other is provided through a variable. And last but not least, the third line is provided through a package parameter. So take a look at that. It wasn't necessary, it was just done to make a point over capabilities and alternatives from a, from a design perspective. But we'll press F5 at this point and we'll run the package. Didn't take very long at all to produce those three lines. And here's the JSON file as we've seen before. Now we'll change things up a little bit and we'll change this from three to a million. Always a nice starting point.
and we'll run this again. All right, so 35 seconds later, we've produced a JSON file with our 1 million rows of data. Now, the exact size of this file is going to vary because the CTE produces random data that can lead to a greater or lesser amount of bits, but that sounds about right. Uh, before we go, let's take a look at a raw file containing that same rough amount of data, certainly a million rows, but again, the number of bytes could differ a bit. Let's compare this 151 megs to what we've achieved in the past with raw files. And there's the answer. So here's a past run of the JSON again containing a million rows. Did that a couple of days ago. Compare that to the raw file that was done previously. And uh, you'll see that there's a big difference. So certainly JSONs, their claim to fame is to be lean and mean compared to XML, but nothing like what can be stored in a condensed format within raw files. So that ends today's demonstration of how we can generate JSON files with SSIS 2012 and 2014. Again, the package can be found on Microsoft's TechNet Gallery. Look for the link to that package on this video's YouTube description. Thanks again for joining us at Dollars and Data.